Good. How's everybody this morning? Good. This morning I'm going to look in the book of Acts. We've been teaching on Sunday through the book of Acts, but I'm not going to follow um, where we left off last Sunday. But today I'm going to speak about the topic of what's your problem with the resurrection. And there's a, there's a number of people that, uh, that need our prayers. Um, pray for um, Christina Jackson's family. Um, her homegoing <coughs> service was on Thursday. Her family's devastated by um, the loss. So pray for them. And there's a number of people that are sick and need a touch from God. So pray for them. And uh, one of the things we can do is we can pray and we can ask the Lord to to intervene. What's the problem with the resurrection? Let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll get into this morning's message. Gracious Father, we thank you. We thank you and we praise you. We, we love you, Lord, and we love your word, and that's why we focus on your word and preach from your word. Your word is meant to transform, and I pray, Lord, that your word would speak resurrection into so many lives. So many people, they come to church, they even grow up in church, but they never grow up in Christ. So they never make a connection with the resurrection. And until you really understand the resurrection, you really un won't understand what you have in Christ. Bless us as we hear the word this morning. Bless us as we celebrate this great resurrection Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 It's good to see Jerry. She's looking fine. <laughs> good to see Jerry at church today. What's the problem with the resurrection? The year was AD 60, the place, the palace of Herod Agrippa II in Caesarea by the sea. The setting, the Apostle Paul has been in jail for two years. Now he stands in chains before the mighty Agrippa great-grandson of Herod the Great, the malevolent king who attempted to butcher the baby boys in Bethlehem. Paul's case has been referred to Agrippa by Festus, who confesses he cannot understand the charges against the Apostle Paul. With the Roman background, Festus cannot comprehend why the Jews hate Paul so much and why Paul keeps talking about a dead man named Jesus, who Paul now claims came alive. And this is in Acts 25, 19. There's one sentence in the whole problem of Easter. You see, Paul believed it, the Jews didn't believe it, and the Romans couldn't understand it. The Jews said Jesus was dead, they verified that. Paul said that Jesus was alive, and poor Festus doesn't have a clue. So many of us, that's our problem. We just don't have a clue. We've heard the story, we've been through so many Easter's, but we simply don't have a clue. So what Festus does, instead of dealing with it, coming to grips with it, he passes the case along to Agrippa, and says, check this case out, it's for your review. And Paul's explanation to the king is very simple. He affirms that a Jew, and as a Pharisee, he shares in the hope of what God had promised to the Jewish people. Those promises were so great that, of necessity, they went way beyond the grave. That is, the promises of the cross. The promises of generations that assumed that God would raise his believing people. Isn't that what Easter's about? Then he asks a question that resonates across many, many centuries. It's Acts 26, 8. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? See, God had raised Lazarus, from the dead, but still people didn't believe that there was one who could raise others from the dead. And this is the great question for Easter morning. It's truly incredible 
the Greek word means against belief, that God could raise the dead. What is more reasonable, that God raises the dead or that God doesn't raise the dead? It may interest you to know that this doctrine was so troublesome right from the very beginning. In Acts 4, verse 2, it tells us that the earliest days of the Christian movement, the Jewish leaders were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming that Jesus is the resurrection of the dead. And it still has problems today. See, even today there's many people who, they understand what resurrection means, but they don't really truly believe it. If they truly believed it, they'd probably live differently and act differently and think differently. See, unbelief has always had a thousand excuses. That's why a lot of people don't consistently engage with God. They don't engage with His Word. They don't engage in a prayer life because they don't really truly believe. And even with the resurrection, we have so many excuses. That's why people don't even consistently come to church. Unbelief always has a thousand excuses. See, some people refuse to believe that God raises the dead because they've never seen it happen. So if they haven't seen it happen, they only believe in what they can see. Others say, I can't do it and I don't know anyone who can do it. Therefore, if I don't know anybody who can do it, well, then I don't think it could happen at all. And I think we should all admit, in one sense, the experience is on the side of probably unbelief. Go to any cemetery. There's many of them in the area. And you scroll through a cemetery and they're quiet, they're peaceful, they're serene, they're beautiful. Nothing much happens in cemeteries except an occasional funeral. And that's our problem with the idea of the resurrection. Funerals we have a plenty. But where are the resurrections? I believe the issue is not fundamentally intellectual or scientific or mechanical or even biological, as if we somehow understand how the dead can be raised. In the end, the problem is really a matter of our heart. It's a matter of the heart. Many people simply do not believe what God has said. Often, most people say they believe in God, but they don't believe his words. They don't believe in what he's written. They don't believe in what he said. Others worship their own intellect. If they can't explain something, they assume that it can't be true. <laughs> but it's incredible. It's against belief to believe that God raises the dead. I answer one question with another. If God can create, why cannot God recreate? See, we have limited thinking. We know that we came from the dust, we know that we shall return to dust. This life we have is temporary. Everybody knows that. From dust behind to dust to come. If God once gives life to dust, can he not do that again? Cannot the watchmaker repair his own broken creation? See, to argue in such a manner on Easter Sunday may be helpful, but probably not totally satisfying or even convincing. When we face our own death, and even more when we face the death of those who we truly love, we need more than just arguments from logic or philosophy. And that brings us back to the New Testament, to the question of what really happened on that first Easter Sunday morning. The accounts vary in details from gospel to gospel. There's even extra biblical texts that speak of, of the crucifixion and resurrection. But the main outline is abundantly clear. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, but just as the sun was about to come up, 
a group of at least five women, led by Mary Magdalene, set out for the tomb of Jesus. They intended to anoint his dead body with spices, since in a rush to get him into the tomb before sundown on Friday, they were not able to finish all that they wanted to do in the preparation of his body for burial. It's clear that they expected to find the tomb guarded by Roman soldiers with a dead body inside. To their shock when they arrived, they found the tomb open and Jesus' body gone. Quickly, returning to the other disciples, they spread the news that someone had taken the body of Jesus. John and Peter ran to the tomb. John got there first. Peter arrived just seconds later, and he went inside. What they found surprised them. The body was indeed gone, but the grave clothes were lying exactly where they had placed them on Friday, just before sundown. <coughs> the Jewish custom of burial involved wrapping a corpse with strips of linen, interlaid with a combination of gummy resins that would harden to form a tight shell around a human body. They made this grave robbing much more difficult and the head was wrapped with a piece of cloth, perhaps swirled around their face like a turban. Evidently, Peter and John saw the grave clothes lying on the ledge in the tomb, almost like an empty cocoon after the butterfly had emerged. The head covering was still in place as well. Must have looked as if the body had just simply, poof, vanished. Somehow passing through the grave clothes without disturbing them, the body wasn't there. Not long after that, Jesus appears to Mary, then to the women, then to Peter, then to the disciples on their road to Emmaus, then to the eleven disciples. A week later, Jesus appears to Thomas, who believes, in spite of his own doubts, cried out, My Lord and my God. See, the doubts were gone from Thomas's mind. This is recorded in the Gospel of John, verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 28. Then quickly the word spread. He's alive! He's alive! This became the watchword for the early church. Jesus is alive. The apostles ended up as martyrs for their faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Who would die a martyr's death if this was all just a story? Every one of the apostles died a martyr's death because their faith in the resurrection of Jesus. And after 2,000 plus years, we can safely say that when the evidence is fairly examined with an unprejudiced mind, the only logical conclusion is that Jesus died on Friday afternoon and that he literally, physically, and bodily rose from the dead on Sunday morning. That brings me back to the basic question once again. Is it incredible to believe that God raises the dead? No, not if we believe in God, right? In the end, we come back to this. Will we believe the testimony of God? Will we believe in his words and what he says? If not, no other arguments will suffice. If yes, no other arguments are actually needed. But I pause to confess that our real problem is not with the empty tomb more than 2,000 years later. Most of us say, yes, I believe Jesus rose from the dead. Almost everybody believes that. Actually, there was a Harris poll conducted. It said that 88% of all Americans believe in the resurrection of Christ. Our deeper struggle comes when we stand by the casket and we look down at the face of somebody that we dearly love. Most of us wonder at that moment, is it even possible that I will see this person again? You see, death seems so final. Death seems 
absolute. And the statistics argue against resurrection. Everyone dies eventually. Nobody makes it out of this world physically alive. You don't hear much about people being raised from the dead nowadays. It would probably make some big headlines. Death seems to win every single time. How do we deal with this problem? Well, here's my answer. It comes in a series of statements. Grant that God is actually God. Grant that He, God, is omnipotent, omnipotent. Grant that He knows all things. Grant that He promised to raise the dead. And grant that He raised His own Son. Amen. Then consider this one final statement. If God can raise Jesus from the dead, God can do anything. Amen. The theologian Spurgeon put it, Difficulty is not in the dictionary of the Godhead. See, if God can raise Jesus on Easter Sunday morning, then he can also raise your loved ones who now rest in the grave. It's not any harder for God to raise 10 million people than to raise one. If you can raise the dead, you can raise the dead. Numbers, locations, cause of death, location of the remains, those things don't matter to God. None of, the, none of it matters to God. Because God doesn't have any trouble reassembling atoms that make up molecules that constitute the bodies of those who have died. Those who have died believing in Jesus Christ. He's God. And God can do it. See, most of us, we like to think that God has lots of power but when it comes right down to it, we wonder, but will God actually have the ability to do it? Because we don't have the faith to believe that he can actually raise people from the dead. But you have to start in the right place. Perspective is all important at this point. God never asks us to start from the year 2023 and reason backwards to the empty tomb. God doesn't ask us to do that. It never works to start with your loved ones and then try to figure things out, how God could raise them. The questions would all be unanswerable. Instead, God tells us to start at the empty tomb and to reason forward from there. We are to start with what we know, that Jesus rose from the dead, and reason to what we don't know, exactly how he will rise the dead in Christ. What he did for Jesus, he will also do for those who follow Jesus in faith. That's what we can faithfully trust God with. But there's, there's things that are roadblocks to our belief. I think there's four stones of unbelief. Having said that, it must be admitted that there are those who vigorously reject everything that I've said so far. For a moment, let's consider the four stones that unbelievers roll in front of Jesus' tomb in order to keep him at arm's length. There's many people that want nothing to do with Jesus, and so there's stones that keep them from that tomb. The first stone is this. There's the stone of atheism. There's some people that claim to be atheists. I often talk to atheists, and I tell them it takes more faith to believe there's nothing than to believe that there's this divine creator, but they're hard to convince. And a person convinced against their will is usually still of the same idea. I mean, they just don't come to understanding. It has to be a God thing. But the stone of atheism, this view says that the dead have ceased to exist. We live, we die, and that's the end of the story. We come from nowhere and we go nowhere. That's what an atheist basically believes. This life is all there is. There's nothing more. Against this, we have the universal testimony to the immorality of the soul and the clear testimony of God's word that life is, is not the end, but life is the beginning. 
We will all live forever somewhere. You could choose to be an atheist, but remember this. We will all live forever somewhere. The second stone of unbelief is the stone of humanism. This view argues that there's no power exists to raise the dead. This would be correct if, if we read that there's no power on earth. People who say this, they believe that science and human intellect are the final arbiters of truth. But that's not true either. If we cannot produce it ourselves, then it must not exist. It must not be true. Such a view simply rules God out of the picture, and we think God has no power. The third stone is the stone of rationalism. Some people use this stone for their unbelief. The stone of rationalism, this view suggests that God would not interfere with the laws of nature. It supposes that if there is a God, he is so uninvolved with creation that, having once set the universe in motion, he will never, ever directly intervene. This notion flies in the face of everything the Bible reveals about who God is. He not only established the universe, he upholds it by his powerful word. The only reason there are laws of nature is because God established the laws of nature. Because he is scripture, because he is the supreme lawgiver, he can momentarily suspend the laws of death and decay and replace them with higher laws regarding resurrection. If God is God, this must be true. And then the the fourth stone is the stone of liberalism. This view declares that God nowhere promises a resurrection and that the resurrection of Jesus is just a myth created by the early church to explain away the death of Christ. It contradicts both the historical record and common sense, not to speak of the clear teaching of the biblical text. This view reveals only to those who reject the resurrection and then want to find a reason to justify their absolute unbelief. The following poem was written by a soldier during World War I. It powerfully expresses what we must follow if Easter is not true. It reads as follows. If death ends all, then evil must be good. Wrong must be right, and beauty ugliness. God is Judas who betrayed his son and with a kiss damns all the world to hell. If Christ rose, not again. But we know differently. You see, not long ago, St. Peter Pioneer Press, they published a picture that was apparently meant to give readers a laugh and a chuckle. It showed a street sign named Cemetery Road. Underneath was another sign that read, Dead End. <laughs> See, the picture captures the way most people think about death. An absolute dead end. They believe that Cemetery Road leads to dead end, to which there is absolutely no escape. Against this pessimism stands the promise of Easter. If death is not the end, if God is God, if God has promised, if God be raised from the dead, what then follows from all of this? If Christ has truly been raised from the dead, then those things that follow are surely the night before day. See, if Christ be raised from the dead, all his promises can be trusted. If Christ be raised from the dead, Christ is alive today. If Christ be raised from the dead, he is with us now. If Christ be raised from the dead, all things end well for those who follow Christ. That's the choice we have to make this Easter morning. This is the best news of all. If you know Jesus, all things end well. See, if you don't know Jesus, things aren't going to go well, and they ain't going to end well either. See, today... May we be filled with tears and tomorrow with troubles 
and day after that with difficulties galore. But if you know Jesus, then in the end, when all is said and done, when we finally come to the last bend in the road, all will be well. Amen. You see, Joseph Clark declared, pillow my head on no guesses when I die. And he's right. See, we may live with guesses and dreams and imaginations and speculative theories while we're alive. But when we take our last breath, dreams and wishes won't do. We must know. We must be certain. We must be sure about what happens next. And the only one who can tell us what happens after we die is someone who has died and actually come back to life themselves. The only person in this category, and there's only one, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He alone can be trusted. It was interesting, you know, when you're in your 60s, like me, you know, and Christina passed away this week. She's just a few months older than me. It gets a little bit scary. I mean, hello. I mean, we're about the same age. I mean, give or take a few months. She still was my older sister, but, um, <laughs> you know, we won't go there. But just a few months. And, um, you know, it's interesting because one of the men of God who was at the, at, the, at the funeral service, he said, if anybody I know is in heaven, it's Christina. And this pastor, this minister, knew her personally, and she attended his church for some time. And I thought to myself, how cool is that, that other people would know, you know, where she ended up just because of her faith. You know, it's funny. Amen. They have these websites with tombstones and it's funny because every once in a while, I don't go to the, I don't go to the cemetery very often, but um, we have a number of family members buried over here at Mount Olivet down on Van Dyke and Six Mile. And um, every once in a while, you know, every few years, you know, for some reason, I'll be in the area. Sometimes I'll stop by. But then you walk by a hundred other grave markers and you wonder, I wonder what that guy was like. I wonder what that lady was like. I wonder what they did for a living. And I wonder where they live. And I wonder where they came from. And I wonder what their background is. You know, they're just gone. So, you know, there's, there's, there's tombstone testimonies. And there's two epitaphs that graphically portray the difference between dying without Christ and dying with Christ. These are actual epitaphs. I've seen this in a book from one of my pastor friends. The first one describes somebody that has no hope. It says, don't bother me now, don't bother me never. I, went, I want to be dead forever and ever. And then there's a second tombstone. It's from Newberry, Massachusetts. It speaks for itself. Here lies in the state of perfect oblivion, John Adams, who died September 2nd, 1811, 879. Death has decomposed him, and at the great resurrection, Christ will recompose him. John Adams. See, death has decomposed him, but the great God will recompose him, our resurrected Christ. One of my favorite stories involves the funeral of Sir Winston Churchill. You know Sir Winston Churchill, the great, the great man from, from, uh, from England during the Second World War. Saved England, maybe saved the world. Who knows? But most of us know him as a man who single-handedly rallied the British people in their darkest days in World War II, when the armies of Hitler were poised to cross the English Channel. By the power of his words, he gave courage to the entire country, the entire British people. He died, but he planned his own funeral before he died at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. The service itself was magnificent by all accounts in every way, filled with the biblical liturgy, great, great hymns of the church. And just as the benediction was pronounced, an unseen bugler, hidden in the side of one of the domes, began to play taps, the traditional melody signaling 
the end of the day, or the death of a soldier. As a mournful notes faded away, another bugler from the other side of the dome began to play revelry. The traditional melody signaling the coming of a new day. It's time to get up, it's time to get up, it's time to get up in the morning. It was Sir Winston's way of saying that though he was dead, he expected to get up on the day of his resurrection. See, on Easter Sunday morning, God sounds the revelry. And Jesus rose up from the dead. Up from the dead, he arose. And because of that day, Cemetery Road no longer is a dead end. See, it's merely a temporary resting place on our voyage to eternity with Almighty God. I want to end somewhere around here, but what's your problem with the resurrection? That's the question I asked from the beginning. What's your personal problem with the resurrection? Why should you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? See, if God is God, then God can raise the dead. If he did it for Jesus, he could do it for you. But some people still try to keep Jesus in the tomb. Matter of fact, there's some denominations, they still keep Jesus on the cross. You see many crosses and Jesus is still on the cross. Jesus isn't on the cross. He's the victor. He arose. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I mean, he's not in the tomb. What stone have you rolled in front of the tomb that keeps Jesus at arm's length from you? See, I told you the excuses we all use. What's your excuse? What issue do you have that keeps you at arm's length from our Savior? It may be the stone of despair. Maybe it's the stone of bitterness. You know, you've had a lot of challenging things happen in your life, so you're just bitter about life. So that keeps you in the stone of unfaithfulness and unbelief. See, for some of us, it might be the stone of doubt or the stone of skepticism, the stone of just absolute unfaithfulness. It's too late. See, Jesus came out of that tomb more than 2,000 years ago, and Jesus never went back in. Some of us want to keep Jesus in the tomb. It doesn't work that way. 1098, the earth starts to shake. 765, a bright light shines. 4321, the stone rolls away. And Christ the Lord is risen today. You see, stones cannot hold him. Death could not keep him. He's alive forevermore. There is good news from the graveyard this morning. Good news because the tomb is empty. The tomb that tried to contain my Lord. There's good news that Jesus rose from the dead. Good news that the devil couldn't hold them. Good news that death has lost its sting. Good news that the grave has lost its victory. Let the people of God rejoice. Christ the Lord has risen today. Let us bow our heads and pray. Gracious Father, Father, I just tried to give an assessment of where a lot of us are. If anyone's in that position, in the place of unbelief, in the place of doubt, in the place of placing a stone between them and a risen Savior. Father, I pray this resurrection morning that they could somehow unite with Christ and move the stone that blocks them from all that God has for them. So many people have put roadblocks and stones in front of their face. They can't see the resurrected Christ, or maybe they don't want to see the resurrected Christ. But Christ the Lord has risen today. Lord, let us prepare our hearts. It's not about chocolate Easter eggs or Easter bunnies or anything like that. It's about the risen Lord. Let us recognize that this day, it's not about an Easter basket or the Easter bunny. It's about Christ. I can tell you with confidence that Christ the Lord is risen today. 
If anybody needs to know him or wants to get to know him, our altars are open. So, Lord, we just pray that this word would go forth. It would not soon depart from our minds or our hearts, that your words are written on the tablets of our hearts, that we would saturate our minds with your precious word. Bless us, Lord, this Easter morning. Christ the Lord has indeed risen this day. We celebrate that more than 2,000 years later. We thank you, Lord, for the resurrection, because if it wasn't for the resurrection, we wouldn't have eternal life. And so we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for the work of the cross. We thank you that you're not on the cross and you're not in the tomb. But Lord, you're in our hearts. If anybody needs that reassurance this morning, come forward. We'll pray with you. We'll believe with you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Bye. Happy Resurrection Sunday. We're going to pray over our food. Um, instead of making everybody wait, we'll pray now and then 